people joining, but let's get started. Um, thank you for joining us today, and thanks in particular to our panelists. I think it promises to be a really interesting uh, session. So um, I'm just going to kick off with a short presentation uh, from Plant Life's point of view, and then I'll hand over to um, Emily Beach from Botanic Gardens Conservation International. Uh, we then have Claire Pinches from Natural England, followed by Saul Herbert from the Woodland Trust. And hopefully that will give us a nice kind of overview of some of the issues around uh, the right tree, right place approach to tree planting. Uh, so Plant Life is a charity that really looks out for the small things in wildlife, so our wildflowers, plants and fungi. And we're working across the UK and internationally to save wildflowers and plants and fungi. Um, this webinar is part of a whole series that we've been running throughout October, which has um, been a fantastic, um, uh, fantastic series of events and very diverse. So uh, if you please have a look on our website and see if there's others that are running up to the end of October, which you might be interested in joining. Uh, we are recording the session today and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, there's lots of other sessions also available there, so please have a look um, and see what else you, you can find of interest. Um, if you've got questions today, then please use the chat function rather than the, the, um, the Q&A. Um, and we'll try and see if there's uh, others in the audience who can help to answer some of those questions. Um, it's brilliant to see we've got lots of people from uh, government agencies and academics and others on board, local authorities and lots of different people uh, joining the session today. So lots of expertise out there as well as on our panel. Um, so please feel free to help answer questions or, or put your own questions uh, in. So just to set up the scene a little bit, um, trees are, obviously one of the major nature-based solutions to climate change. Um, particularly at the, at the moment, this is very current. We've got the uh, COP26 coming up in just a couple of weeks in Glasgow. We've got the UN Biodiversity Conference, uh, which part of which took place this month, and then the next part is uh, coming forward next year. Um, so lots of new uh, policy and hopefully agreements uh, coming through on the international scene and tree planting really at the heart of that is a way to absorb carbon and um, tackle some of the issues around biodiversity and deforestation. Uh, just this week, the UK government published its net zero strategy just in time for COP26. Um, and that includes a, a tree planting target of getting up to 30,000 hectares per year by 2025, and that's across the UK. So we all know that trees are fantastic for absorbing and storing carbon and, um, and that woodlands and trees are incredibly important for our biodiversity as well. But of course, it's not that simple and there are lots of questions to be asked. So it's not simply a case of plant trees for carbon in nature. It doesn't really work in quite such a simple way, unfortunately. Um, but tree planting is an incredibly powerful thing that people can do, that almost anyone can do. It seems very symbolic, it's easy to measure, it's very nice and visual, and you can feel like you've taken a really practical action, which is, which is fantastic. Um, but of course, there's lots of questions which we're going to explore today about making sure you have the right tree in the right place. So first of all, what kind of tree are you going to plant or help to regenerate? Um, there's so many different species and Emily will take us through um, the, the global picture soon about the uh, different species of trees and those at risk of extinction and how reforestation and um, woodland and tree management can help to make sure that that diversity of tree species um, thrives in the future. Um, where are the seeds and the saplings coming from? We, there, there is some natural regeneration going on, but also a lot of tree planting, and that requires those saplings to be, to be produced in nurseries or, or elsewhere. Um, and there's concerns that, that a lot of these should be locally produced or at least domestically uh, produced so that we're not bringing pests and diseases in um, and circulating around different countries. Um, and there's a question about the use of peat in sapling production as well by nurseries. So 
um, making sure that uh, we're not digging up peat uh, and releasing carbon and destroying wildlife habitats in, also in order to plant trees for carbon and for nature. There's lots of questions which uh, Claire will explore in particular about where trees can be planted or where we can encourage natural regeneration um, and looking at making sure those, you know, what type of woodland is, is, is being created, how do they fit into the landscape, um, what are the natural kind of ecological networks that those new woodlands or trees will form part of. Um, and we, we really need to see that connection and expansion of existing woodlands um, and other tree habitats as part of a mosaic and a landscape of lots of different types of, of habitats for wildlife. Um, what's on the site already, again, Claire will talk a, a bit about this and Saul as well, um, looking at uh, what might be there in terms of the, the, the wildlife on the sites already or the other kind of functions of those sites, whether they're floodplains or um, have different uh, purposes um, that we need to take into account before we start uh, planting trees. And the long-term management is absolutely crucial as well. So how would those trees and the land be managed in the long-term? And that needs to be sorted out before you get started really to make sure that it's, it's not just sticking a tree in the ground and walking away, but actually um, making sure that you're creating something which is gonna benefit climate and nature and people in the long-term. So there's some big questions there and we'll, we'll be exploring those uh, this afternoon. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few of plant life's uh, key concerns around, around this issue um, to make sure that we do get that maximum benefit for, for nature and the climate in, in particular. Um, there's obviously lots of issues around benefits for people from trees and woodlands, which we won't be going into so much today, but um, just to recognize that that's another key issue. Um, so, I live in Wiltshire, quite close to Salisbury Plain, and uh, listening to BBC Radio Wiltshire. Uh, this this week, in fact, um, they were having a discussion about tree planting and where you could put lots more trees uh, within Wiltshire. Um, and the DJ said, well, what about Salisbury Plain? You know, it's a big, vast expanse of nothingness, he said. Um, you know, let's not be too fussy about it. Let's just crack on and start planting trees. Um, and actually, a spokesperson from the Woodland Trust said, well, you know, it's not quite that simple. But if you think about Salisbury Plain, this is what a lot of people think of, just this vast expanse of, of greenness and not much there. So you hear people quite often saying, well, there's nothing there in grassland. But of course, if you look closer, at Salisbury Plain is, is one of the most important chalk grassland sites in Europe. Um, we're incredibly privileged to have this in, in the UK, and it's a massively important site for wildlife. But of course, you need to look a bit closer at these, these wildflowers and other species that are living in the grassland and to know um, that they, that site is, is important and needs to be managed for those species. So you need to know what's there. Um, grasslands in particular uh, need better recognition as a, a carbon store. So grasslands store a third of the world's land-based carbon. So that's a third of all carbon in plants and, and in the soils. Um, and they don't get the recognition for that. Um, species rich grasslands also store more carbon than uh, your kind of monoc monoculture grass. And um, Plant Life uh, has launched the Grasslands Plus campaign, which I encourage you to, to look up um, to get that recognition for grasslands at COP26 and beyond. Um, other open habitats, so we hear a lot about peatland and obviously they're incredibly important stores of carbon as well and for biodiversity. Um, and we need to make sure those are protected uh, from inappropriate tree planting. There's also some tricky questions to be asked um, in terms of sites where we, where we have had uh, trees planted for the last 50, 60 years, um, and lots of plantations that were, that were put in place to grow timber after the Second World War. And lots of those are now coming to the point where they're being harvested. Um, we do get fires, obviously, um, on the Dorset Heath uh, last year, there were kind of massive fires. And those do create the opportunity to say, well, you know, what are we gonna do with this land? And plant life and others are um, keen to make sure, oh, excuse me, um, that, the, um, that the, 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 these sites are not just replanted as uh, forestry plantations, but the opportunity is taken to restore habitats like lowland heathlands, 
um, which we've lost 80% of um, in the UK. And these soils are, are perfect for, for restoring those open habitats. Um, so we need to see that commitment to, to the open habitats as well as uh, the trees and woodland. And of course, there's lots of different types of woodland. Um, so the, the plantations that you see on the right there, you know, were, were main, mainly aimed for producing timber. Um, and so not so much with nature in mind. And you can tell that when you're in one of these dark and densely planted uh, woodlands that there's, there's very little life. Um, and the contrast with this uh, temperate Atlantic woodland, which is Britain's rainforest, um, and there's just an incredible diversity of life and the, the mosses and fungi and lichens and uh, incredible trees that are in those, those woodlands. So we need to see woodlands that are doing their bit for wildlife as well as uh, for the climate. So just to emphasize that point, that's um, having those healthy woodlands for climate and nature. And that's what plant life wants to see um, making sure that we're protecting and restoring open habitats alongside these, these healthy woodlands. So that's it for me. I'm going to move on to introduce today's speakers. Um, and we're going to start off with a global perspective uh, from Emily Beach at the Botanic Gardens Conservation International. We'll talk about uh, the state of the world's trees and those species uh, at risk of extinction, um, as well as uh, their work on the rules for reforestation and, uh, and biodiversity. We'll then get down to uh, the national level with Claire Pinches from Natural England, who will talk about uh, the right tree and right place approach within England and how that's being used to make sure that we meet the tree planting targets um, that have been set by government. And finally, Saul Herbert from the Woodland Trust, who's working on the, the Woodland Trust's uh, new woodland creation guidelines. And he'll be looking in a bit more detail at the practical level um, in the field uh, of how you create woodland in practice. So I'm gonna hand over now to, uh, to Emily to give her presentation. Great, thank you very much, Jenny. Thanks, Emily. Great, so as Jenny said, I'm Emily Beach and I'm Tree Red List Manager at BGCI, Botanic Gardens Conservation International. Um, and I'm gonna talk about uh, an international perspective on, on tree planting. Um, so BGCI is a membership organization of botanical institutions. So Botanic Gardens or Arboreta, seed banks. Um, and we have members in more than a hundred countries around the world. So that makes us the largest plant conservation network um, with over 60,000 plant scientists, horticulturalists and educators working across the world to save plant species from extinction. And BGCI aims to mobilize botanic gardens and other partners to secure plant diversity worldwide. So what do we do about trees? So in terms of tree planting, it is a, a hot topic at the moment, especially with COP26 coming up. Um, so it's been proposed as a mitigation method um, for carbon capture and um, climate change, but how we, do, how we do that really matters. So much tree planting does have a focus on, um, on trees in the ground um, and not necessarily thinking about the biodiversity implications of those tree planting decisions. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the data that we've gathered in order to inform tree planting efforts. So here you can see the report, the state of the world's trees. And this was released um, in September. And it was the first report summarizing the conservation status of the world's almost 60,000 tree species. Um, so this is the work of uh, more than seven years worth of work on, on uh, the trees of the world and finding out which specific trees are, in, are threatened with extinction. Um, the project started with the list of trees. So, up until 2017, there wasn't a list of tree species. Um, so we created Global Tree Search, which brought together research from all over the world to have a definitive list of tree species. And, their, um, and then we worked to create conservation assessments for those species. So we worked with more than 500 people all over the world to assess the extinction risk of trees across the globe. 
and these are the results. So here we can see um, that there are 58,497 tree different types of tree um, in the world. And sadly, at least 30% of them are at risk of extinction. So 17,510 species are known to be threatened with extinction. This is actually twice as many um, as threatened mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles added together. Um, but trees don't get quite as much press individually. <laughs> um, sadly, uh, already 142 species are extinct, completely extinct. Um, and then we've also got these data deficient species, 7,000 of those, which are species that are insufficiently known, so we're not sure if they're threatened or not. Um, so if those species are threatened, um, rates of extinction could be up to 50% threatened with extinction. So what is threatening the trees of the world? Well, uh, the main one is agricultural expansion. So that includes all different types of agriculture, plantations, um, grazing, uh, cattle. Um, and then we've got uh, logging, livestock farming, um, and then residential and commercial developments um, and fire, et cetera, et cetera. An emerging threat I think you can see on the end is climate change. Um, so the reason that is so low down in terms of percentages is mainly because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, but the species included in that category at the moment would be uh, things like island species, um, seeing an increase in hurricanes, for example, or sea level rises um, or droughts. OK, so we developed um, in collaboration with all of these partners, um, we developed the Global Tree Portal, which you can find on the BGCI website. And this is a visualization of all of BGCI's databases together with a focus on trees. Um, so it takes the list of trees, Global Tree Search, Threat Search, which is um, conservation assessments, plant search, which is ex situ conservation data, so data from botanic gardens, um, and garden search, which is our list of gardens around the world. And this is the first time there's been a synthesis of this information. And this is designed for policymakers and practitioners. So you can use the country search and get a checklist of tree species for a certain country with endemism. Um, included and threat statuses for every tree species in that country. Um, so this is a great way for people to get up to date information about the trees that they could use in their um, tree planting efforts. The um, portal also includes some conservation tracking information. Um, so we've gathered data on conservation actions for individual species. Um, and organizations and inv individuals can contribute to this. Um, so at the moment, I think this is from an ASA species. So you can see some details about how this species is already protected um, and which actions have not yet been done for this specific species. So um, as I said, many tree planting efforts are not biodiversity specific. And also um, many of the regulatory frameworks or certifications that people use um, are not biodiversity specific. Um, so recently there was a paper published um, called the 10 golden rules for restoring forests. Um, and here's a graphic from that um, paper, um, which you can find online. And that sets out the most important things to consider when starting a reforestation project. Um, and these really focus on the use of um, native and endemic and threatened species um, in order to maximize biodiversity. That's one of the key, the key rules. Um, and sort of to respond to this, um, BGCI will be launching the Global Biodiversity Standard uh, for tree planting. So this is a methodology which builds on those 10 rules um, and, and the scientific evidence and will recognize and promote the protection, restoration and enhancement of biodiversity through tree planting um, and tree planting projects. And that will include um, some desk study, but also some verification on the ground. Um, so just before I finish, I wanted to just give the UK perspective. Um, so the UK has fairly small number of native tree species compared to say Madagascar, which has over 3000 tree species. Um, so in the UK, we have 86 native tree species 
and there are 33 threatened species in the UK, all of which are sorbus, which is your rowans and white beans, um, which are species with small ranges. Um, and we're also, we'll all be familiar with the near threatened species that we have, which is the ash. Um, so yeah, that's just a bit of a UK perspective and I look forward to answering questions at the end. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Emily. That gives a really, really helpful overview of um, that global picture and, and you know the variety of tree species that we that we could be looking at in in different countries. Um, I'm going to hand over now straight to Claire Pinches uh, from Natural England to talk about the right tree, right approach, right right tree, right place approach that uh, that Claire's working on. Thanks, Claire. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you can see my presentation. As Jenny says, um, I work for Natural England as a principal scientific analyst, and I've been working very closely with colleagues, many of whom are on this call, I think, in Forestry Commission, Forestry England, DEFRA and Forest Research to make sure that the government's tree target is delivered in, in such a way as to ensure the protection and recovery of nature as well as, of uh, course, to um, ensure increased carbon sequestration. So I'm going to take you for a very kind of quick canter, really, about what we've been doing to that, to that end. First, a bit of context, um, and this is England specific. Uh, the England Tree Action Plan was launched in May 2021, um, so earlier this year, and it provides a vision for treescapes to 2050 to realise a range of public benefits, not simply carbon. Um, the nat that, that is actually, a lot of that's been funded in the short term by the Nature of Carbon Fund, which, uh, of which the £640 million for peat and tree action, um, more than £500 million of that is on trees and woodlands. And that's being delivered by the England Tree Planting Programme, the so-called ETTP, and that encompasses a, a quite a range of activities, including the new scheme to um, deliver, uh, Woodland Creation, which is the England Woodland Creation Offer, which colleagues, Forestry Commission colleagues are, are well placed to answer questions on, and also the Local Authority Treescapes and Urban Tree Challenge Funds, and also a wide range of community forest and partnership projects, such as the, uh, the Woodlands for Water Scheme. So where this woody habitat goes obviously critically influences its ability to enhance um, nature's recovery and deliver, deliver other important benefits. So on that, we're one of the least wooded countries in, in Europe and establishing new native woodlands, trees and woody habitats has a pivotal role really to play in nature's recovery, injecting much needed structural complexity into our landscapes. So in terms of where it has most value for nature, it's really following the Lawton principles of establishing um, expanded, um, better buffered and, and joined up habitats. There's also a real um, potential to integrate many more native trees and, rub, um, and shrubs into our farmland and better manage these. Things like hedgerows, wood pastures provide fantastic value for nature. They have a host of other natural capital benefits, but they also don't require the um, land use change that, um, that woodland conversion to woodland necessitates from farmland. So that can make them more attractive in certain instances. And finally, we've been working very hard with um, Forestry Commission colleagues to encourage the use of natural colonisation in suitable locations where it's most likely to basically um, enable expansion uh, of woodland. So, for example, adjacent to ancient woodlands or old hedgerows. And I should say that um, natural colonisation means the expansion of woodland habitats, whilst natural regeneration means the regeneration of trees within woodland habitats. Sometimes the two are conflated. So that, that technique provides a, uh, that na natural process creates complex nature rich habitats en route to close canopy woodlands. And really in terms of the kind of planted approach what we'd like to um, encourage, it's really to mimic that structurally complex native woodland that we know provides habitat for a diversity of species. So there are some challenges um, currently in, in how we do this in a way which really delivers for nature alongside all those other natural capital benefits, public benefits. 
So one of these is that the delivery of the tree target is running somewhere ahead of some of the other 25 year environment plan ambitions. Um, and in particular, um, the local nature recovery strategies, which have been piloted, but they've not been rolled out yet. So currently there's a lack of a spatial framework to inform many decisions. Hopefully we'll get that soon. Um, the other, one of the other issues is that land being put forward for woodland creation um, at presently is often agriculturally mar marginal, so it has a relatively low economic value for farmland. But because of that, perhaps because it's been in it's inaccessible on a steep slope on, on wet on wet ground, it's actually often retained quite high nature value. So there's a little bit of a wicked problem there in terms of the land that's becoming available. And of course, the other issue is we've got imperfect knowledge of the location of re remaining priority habitats, priority species, and also the extent, depth and condition of, of peat. So I'm now gonna tell you what we're doing to address some of these, um, these, these challenges and um, working with and across the DEFRA family really, we're ensuring that um, easy access to high quality and reliable um, and easily understandable environmental data is, is made um, more readily available. So one of the things that we've been doing is developing better mapping solutions. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of these. The first is um, represents an initial collaboration between BSBI, the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, Natural England and, and the Woodland Trust. And um, it's now being taken forward um, more substantively by um, the Natural Capital Ecosystem Assessment Project, which is a government funded project. And this is to use BSBI's many millions of records um, for plants to map habitat indicator species. So those species which are really faithful to high quality habitats and to use those as a means to plug gaps in our existing inventories um, against which to screen proposed tree planting proposals. So this work involves applying a series of checks. The first one is to say, are any high risk priority species present on the site? And by high priority species, I mean species which are rare, scarce or threatened and in terms of their conservation status. And those species tend to be mapped at a hundred meter resolution. So quite a, quite a um, fine scale resolution. And you can see on the, on, on the image on this slide, that's, a, that's an image of Ingleborough, and it's showing the rare, scarce, threatened species there, mapped at that scale. The second filter looks at a wider suite of species, which are typically mapped at a, a, at a rather cruder um, spatial scale, so at a one, one kilometer square scale. And these are habitat indicator species that uh, effectively represent those species which, which tend to be or, or very reliably um, found in species rich grasslands, in lowland heathlands, in high quality habitats. So they've been drawn from um, a BSBI list, which, um, which is called the Axiophyte list, and also from the um, Common Standards Monitoring, um, which the nature conservation agencies use to determine condition of, on high quality habitats. They've been assigned to 10 broad habitat types, and as I say, mapped at a 10 kilometer square. Yes. Square, square, square scale, sorry. Um, if numbers are above a certain threshold, then basically that suggests that a need for a site survey will be flagged because clearly there's remnant interest there. Um, this method also accounts for differences in survey coverage and effort. So if there are, new, if there are no or few indicator species present, no records, we need to look and determine whether that's that's a, a true absence or whether it, it's, it's um, simply that the square hasn't been well recorded. So we have a way of doing that. And that approach helps identify data black holes, areas entirely lacking in survey coverage. So at the moment with this work, um, it's still under development and there's various aspects that we're working through. Um, but ho ho hopefully um, in time, and you know, by the end of this, um, this financial year, it will hopefully provide a very useful way of screening woodland establish, um, establishment applications against botanically interesting areas. And it's got a far wider, um, wider scope for application in terms of spatial planning for, for other activities as well for nature recovery. So the second bit of heat map work I'm coming on to is the, um, 
Reading Wader's heat map. And this reflects um, work that's again under development and is being led by colleagues in Forestry Commission um, and also um, the, the BTO, the British Trust for Ornithology. So obviously new woodland creation and regeneration provides opportunities for biodiversity, including birds, but it also can um, involve risks to some bird species and assemblages. And perhaps of most prominence amongst those um, are breeding waders, which are obviously a very key uh, priority for conservation, given the, the steep declines in species like curlew. So woodland creation can adversely affect those both by direct take of the open habitats on, on, on which they breed, but also through increased risk of the predation for the predation halo. Um, and the Forestry Commission has funded BTO to develop a model to map predicted relative abundance of 10 breeding wader species at one kilometer square. And really that work provides the key to unlocking sp a spatial solution to wader recovery and will inform our um, um, approach to um, determining the, uh, the appropriateness of woodland, woodland uh, creation proposals. So it allows development of zonal maps and decision support tools, which can guide wader conservation uh, forestry expansion and indeed other land use changes. So it's an incredibly helpful piece of work. And whilst we haven't got it quite um, yet, hopefully it's 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 not it's not far from um, being um, available. The other bit of work we've been doing with Forestry Commission is um, improving the nature of the site surveys that are done before um, before woodland creation occurs. And really, those are done in situations where there's uncertainty to confirm or establish the presence of environmental features on the land. And they enable um, FC to be provided with the data to accurately assess environmental impacts of those proposals before any decisions are made on their appropriateness. So historically, surveys supplied by applicants have been of quite variable quality, and that can sometimes slow the process of determination down. So for that reason, um, any and Forestry Commission have developed new best practice surveys for peat, for breeding waders, and for vegetation, so for priority habitats. And those were launched back in spring 2021. Um, in certain areas, they encompass some fairly significant changes. For example, the breeding wader survey, as I said previously, it um, in recognition of the fact that there's a predation halo, it requires survey of the woodland creation site and any suitable habitat in a one kilometer buffer around that site. And surveys are helpfully funded at 70% of costs under the Forestry Commission's Woodland Creation Planning Grant. So that's really helpful, um, that work, because it um, enables more efficient decision-making by FC and indeed um, any when proposals are, um, are near um, triple size. And the final bit of work I was going to tell you about uh, relates to the development of decision support tools. Um, there's probably quite a lot more work um, that we can we can do on this, but one of the um, ones that's already out there is um, a peach and tree and new afforestation um, decision support tool. That recognises that peatlands are obviously critical to achieving net zero and nature recovery ambitions. They're vital um, long-term and stable stores of carbon, so clearly um, uh, growing trees on them, um, which, which dries them out, um, causes oxidation of the peat and, um, and loss of carbon into the atmosphere and into also water courses as dissolved organic carbon. It was recognized that in order to ensure proper alignment between the tree and peat action plans and the consistency and the advice given by FC and any staff on the ground, that we needed really to have a fully evidence-led decision support tool. And the guidance launched marks a really important step in that peatland production, uh, in that peatland protection. So under the um, new guidance, woodland creation will not be grant funded on peat greater than 30 centimetres or thicker or any shallow peat or peaty soils associated with that. So that's a, that's a really good um, positive um, progression because it basically the, um, the peat used to be protected at 50 centimetres steps. So I think that's a helpful development. And really, um, I, that's all I wanted to say, but to just uh, make clear that we're, we're working hard to make sure that we really do get the right trees in the right place 
and allow both the uh, woody and non-woody components of the nature recovery networks to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. That's that's incredibly useful um, kind of overview, and I think it shows some of the the complexity of uh, of the challenge really in making sure that uh, that we are getting the right tree in the right place and not um, not destroying other biodiversity and carbon in in the meantime. Um, so just in the interest of time, so we've got time for questions at the end. I'm going to move straight on uh, and ask Saul Herbert from the, the Woodland Trust to talk about their approach to woodland creation. Thanks, Saul. Excellent. Thanks, Jenny. Um, yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Saul from the UK conservation team uh, at the Woodland Trust. And um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some work we've been doing to review and refine our approach to woodland creation. Uh, it's been a project that's been going on for about a year or so now, uh, essentially uh, reflecting the fact that the Woodland Trust is involved in around about half of the native woodland creation in the UK, either directly on our own estate or through the work of our advisors uh, and partners. Um, and, and as you would expect, we have uh, big aspirations, big targets for woodland creation, not only in terms of scale and, and extent, but also in terms of you know, what that can deliver for people and wildlife. So as we're looking to ramp up the scale of our delivery, we're also really concerned about the quality of it uh, and what, what outcomes that achieves. Uh, we're hoping to publish a substantial guide within a few weeks now. It's, it's close, the, the publication of our, our guide to woodland creation. Um, and um, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other outputs from the project towards the end of this presentation. Um, just a few things about the scope of this presentation and our current piece of work that I think are important to mention. The first is really what we're focusing on here is looking at things at site scale. So Claire's talked about this kind of strategic targeting, opportunity mapping, where should new woods and trees go. Finding available land is so key to meeting woodland creation targets. This piece of work is really looking at, at how we approach things once an area of land has become available for woodland creation. So that's the first thing to say. The other is, and I've seen there's some stuff in the chat, this approach is also very much uh, on the assumption of a competent advisor at the heart of the process. Woodland creation is not straightforward uh, and we're building this around uh, the, the advice process, a competent advisor. Um, and the last thing to say is it's asterisked here, woodland creation, by that we mean all woods and trees in all contexts, uh, urban and rural, um, and, you know, that certainly includes, uh, yeah, open grown trees uh, and individual trees, as well as uh, what might be more typically thought of as woodland. So, as I say, we're about to publish this really substantial guide on our approach. Um, I want to just try and give a very quick overview of it here and pick out a few of the key messages. And the first thing to say is that our whole guide, our whole approach is very much objectives driven. So if we want new woods and trees to deliver for people and wildlife, we need to start by at site scale by describing clearly what our objectives are. And we've got these eight themes uh, for objective setting for woodland creation here. Um, and I, I think the point about these is, is any or all of these can be dialed up and down at site scale. The only thing I would say about the Woodland Trust's approach is there's an assumption that nature recovery will always feature strongly, uh, regardless of which other uh, objectives here might be uh, might also be a priority. Um, rather than rattling through those uh, as a list, I think it's more informative to provide a couple of quick examples um, and um, and also to illustrate what, what, what I think is the scalability of this uh, kind of vision and objective setting approach. So this is an example of the smaller end of our work, our product called More Woods, uh, aimed at, at woodland creation on sites of three hectares or less. Uh, and you, you know, this is this is an example of a kind of a vision and some over uh, some some top level objectives. So you can see we're talking about creating quality habitat. We're talking about creating recreational space, albeit for a relatively small number of people and also a kind of a modest productivity objective here, but providing real clarity to inform the, the, the design and establishment uh, of a small woodland creation project. And I contrast that with this example. This is for uh, one of our largest projects in England at the moment uh, in the Yorkshire Dales, a site called Snay's Home. 
uh, where we're looking at um, essentially a, a large part of an entire valley or catchment. Um, so we have a significant vision for change at landscape scale. Um, and, and as you might expect, we therefore have a slightly wider range and more complex set of objectives. So beyond talking about habitat, the site has uh, species objectives, particularly around black grouse, also red squirrel on the site here. Uh, we have climate change, we have carbon objectives for this project. We also have a whole suite of water-based objectives because both reducing flood risk and improving water quality uh, are really important in this location. Um, and also a really key one, this is in uh, the Northern Forest project for ourselves. Uh, it's also in the Yorkshire Dales National Park. So landscape, enhancing landscape value uh, and character is a really important part of this project. And I think there are a lot of concerns in the uplands about what these targets for woodland creation mean in terms of the sort of visual impact on the landscape. And I think projects like this offer a real opportunity to show how well-designed and well-delivered we can creation can enhance these, these highly valued landscapes. So our approach, our guide, is structured across five phases, five chapters of the guide. I've described the first already, that's about setting a clear vision and objectives uh, and using those to engage stakeholders and, and build consensus uh, around a project or proposal. Um, We've had a bit of talk already about the site assessment phase. So the next phase, once you're clear about why you're doing something is to understand the site and the land that you have available. Um, Claire's talked about some tools, some decision-making tools to inform site assessment. Jenny talked about the importance of understanding existing features in terms of grasslands and other semi-natural habitats. So we have a description of a site assessment process. We're actually publishing a separate site assessment handbook with a little bit more detail on how to carry that out and sources of data and information um, that advisors and landowners can use to inform this. I won't say too much more about that other than I think there is a, a really important, if fairly subtle shift in language that we're looking at here, which is moving away from this idea of constraints on woodland creation, to talking much more about features. So talking about conservation, semi-natural habitats as features of the site, which inform the design process and the development of new woodland, uh, rather than as something that stops us from planting trees, if you like. I think that's a, an important change of focus. So the vision and the assessment phase come together in a design process. This is the absolutely key bit. It's really where we ensure that great outcomes are achieved and that quality is achieved in our woodland creation work, and that it's not simply a numbers game about hectares or tree numbers. Um, and then that moves us on. We've, dis we've dis described the rest of the process in two phases. We've called them initiate and establish. And really that's about the fact that there's a lot of activity in the early years around planting or ground prep or fencing or whatever it might be to get, to get trees established and trees growing. Um, but woodlands, functioning natural woodland ecosystems take time to develop. So the establishment phase, We've got that described here. You could think of it as something like a 20 year process to get to the point where you have functioning native wood. Uh, the opening slide had those eight themes for visioning and objectives. Those themes run all the way through the guide. And in the design chapter, we have a set of design principles for each of those uh, themes. Now, a lot of them are, are signposted to guidance that's already available elsewhere. But what I've got here are our design principles for woodland creation for nature recovery. I think they're the most original bit and they're obviously really at the heart of our work and therefore very important to us. So we talk about predominantly native trees, as Emily talked about, the importance of conserving, you know, our, our native, not only species, but also the genetic diversity of our native woods and trees. Um, this issue of structural complexity is absolutely key. We want to move away from the idea of uniform plantation style woodland creation to, the, to creating uh, woodland with much greater structural complexity. We talk about structural components. We describe them as groves, open wooded habitats and glades to, to help our staff, our advisors to build greater complexity into their woodland creation designs. These other two, I think, have been touched on by other speakers as well. So restoring and enhancing other conservation features. Really strongly believe that there is a kind of win-win situation here. 
that woodland creation can also drive the enhancement and restoration of, of other open habitats and other features on the site. Uh, and alongside that, restoring natural processes, natural hydrology, natural disturbance uh, factors, grazing and browsing, and also the kind of natural regeneration and competition uh, um, processes on the site as well. There's also important to think about specific species considerations and what can be done to address the requirements of, of priority species and also considering the site in its context and its contribution to, uh, to wider habitat networks. Um, so those are really key for us set of design principles for, um, for new woodland. Um, this is an attempt to illustrate them here. Um, these, are, these three black and white images are uh, borrowed from the landscape architect uh, at the Forestry Commission. The typo, I'm pretty sure, is original and not my own. Um, but what they're essentially trying to do is illustrate an evolution from uh, thinking about uh, language around woodland and open space, by which people often visualise this middle image here of high canopy woodland with cut out glades and rides within it, to um, this bottom right hand image, a much more complex mosaic of structure and habitat. Um, I'll just mention this very briefly, there may well be questions about this. Uh, we talk in terms of species, I think we have two clear aims. One is to build uh, functioning um, woodland communities. So think about how tree species and shrub, shrub species interact and work together to form communities. And the other is local distinctiveness. So we really want to make sure that we don't get into some kind of a the more the better psychology around tree species um, addressing climate change resilience. So we have another, sub, uh, another supplement, a tree species handbook. Some of these maps are drawn from that, looking not at native range, but at appropriateness of different tree species for use in woodland creation. So where the shading is lighter, it doesn't mean that a tree species shouldn't be used, but that specific site by site considerations uh, maybe a, a stronger justification might be required in some of those instances. That's a real whiz through our guide. What we've got here is a final slide of just a couple of illustrations of the design process. So this kind of graphically represented iterative process of a concept design, which informs stakeholder engagement leading to a finalized design. This is a 45 hectare extension to Pepperwood, one of our ancient woodland sites in the West Midlands. And I think it really illustrates how we can start to build that kind of complexity into our woodland creation designs. And I just finished by saying we're aiming to publish our, our, our first guide, our substantial guide next month. Um, and then there's lots of activity to flow from that. So further guidance. The main guide is very much aimed at professional and advisor audience. We are looking at other publications around this for local authorities and for landowners and so on. Um, but also, I think really importantly, this is helping us to identify some big skills gaps, particularly around things like site assessment and design phases. Um, and we'll be working with partners to develop training materials to start to address some of those skills gaps as well. Um, and that is me. Thank you, Jenny. That's great. Thank you, Saul. Um, yeah, it's great to see the some of the, the practicalities coming coming through, and uh, look forward to seeing the, the guidance when it's when it's published. Um, can I ask all the panelists to put their, their video back on, please, so we can um, take some of the questions? I think it's been a really interesting overview from different perspectives of uh, yeah some of the uh, the ins and outs of, of of meeting these tree planting targets and the, the complexities of getting the right tree in the right place. Um, we've there's some some really good chat going on uh, and probably more than we can cover in the next uh, 10 minutes but um we'll just try and pull out a few key questions um and if there's anything that any of the panelists have seen that you'd like to pick up on specifically then please uh please go for it um i just wanted to cut there's some a question about natural regeneration and i just wondered i uh, just wanted to put that to anyone on, on the panel really how what role you see particularly for natural regeneration compared to tree planting um, and how 
what kind of role how far that can get us in in meeting some of the the tree planting targets and getting getting the right tree in the right place Does anyone like to tackle that i suspect sol and i have something to say on that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, i can go first if you like and, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try and keep it short um, I think um, from a natural kingdom perspective, we think it could have a very valuable role um, in, um, especially in and around um, existing um, native woodland. Um, work from Monkswood um, in Cambridgeshire that CEH have done has demonstrated um, basically how well woodland can establish and the, also the value of the, of the scrubby, flower-rich, nectar-rich, um, successional habitat for nature that um, is, is kind of part of the longer, slower succession. Um, and that, that uh, other studies show that that demonstrates, that habitat demonstrates um, or um, supports a range of, of threatened wildlife. So um, yes, I think we see it as, as providing fantastic habitat to actually address the, the nature crisis now en route to um, close canopy woodlands. Thank you, Claire. Did you want to come in and Saul on that as well? Um, I would uh, just a couple of things that I would add. I mean, the first one I would say is um, if we look at targets, thirty thousand hectares a year. You know, um, we're just nowhere near having the tree nursery capacity to deliver the trees that we need to meet those targets. So it's really important that we work with the nursery sector and build that capacity. But realistically, if we want to meet those targets, natural regen is going to have to be part of the story because you know. Uh, we can achieve extent that way that, that we're simply not, uh, I don't believe, going to achieve to plant in the next decade. So that's one thing I would say. The other is in, in you know, in our approach, um, I would push back really hard on the idea, for example, that we need assisted migration or uh, novel species to achieve resilience in the change of a, in the face of a changing climate. Uh, but what, what can build adaptation to site conditions is natural regeneration. Every time trees seed, you get this huge diversity of genetic resource created and a selection process through natural regeneration that, that essentially uh, promotes trees that are well adapted to site conditions. So that makes it really valuable in building robust new woods, but also ongoing in terms of woodland management. And continuous cycles of natural regeneration are then really important to to build resilience and, and create well-adapted mm -hmm. trees. So for both of those reasons, I think natural colonisation is an absolutely essential part of the story uh, for, for woodland creation for the next decade. And just to add an international point, I would say that that's probably true for many other places as well. Um, and although we've probably lost a lot more of our natural forests than most other, uh, many other places, um, so we've got really a, a key point that we should be protecting rather than um, destroying and then uh, trying to do something about it. Um, and that also we should be encouraging the conditions for uh, natural regeneration because it's going to be a lot easier than trying to get some of these extremely complex and diverse um, species assemblages to come back. In the UK, we don't have so many tree species, but somewhere like Madagascar with hundreds per in a small area, it's key that we do that too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, everyone. I think um, maybe part of the challenge is that it's much harder to, to measure the, uh, the natural regeneration and the number of trees that are being regenerated rather than you know, counting the ones that you're actually putting in the ground. Um, but yeah, certainly a lot of benefits to, to that approach. Um, there's, um, there's some good points uh, coming through and thank you to Samantha from the Forestry Commission answering a lot of things there and making some good points uh, about the, what, what's happening uh, from the Forestry England Forestry Commission side. Um, we haven't talked that much about um, urban trees and there is um, there's quite a few comments and questions about that and um, you know and obviously some very high profile issues around uh, urban trees being being cut down. Um, and I wonder if, uh, if the panelists have views on how we kind of move move forward on that and that, you know, how, how we make sure that the urban trees are a part of this picture as well as um, in the 
in the countryside and uh, farmland. Um, I, I, I can start on that one if you like. Um, I, I said at the outset that our approach is, is about woods and trees in all contexts. Um, I, I think that there's a huge amount of value that, that can be created by, by thinking about woodland creation in urban contexts. We talk about the idea of the urban forest, so that you know the, the, the ecological principles of structural complexity of those different components of a woodland ecosystem, ground floor, a shrub layer, high canopy, can all be created in an urban environment. It's just that the spatial configurations might appear a bit different, spread between gardens and street trees and parks and so on. Um, but, uh, but I think the principles can be applied uh, and I think that's really important. We're doing an enormous amount of work. We, we put a call out to local authorities to create uh, an emergency tree plan to respond to climate change, to, to create, to, to, to develop woodland creation plans. And we're working through our own emergency tree fund to, to grant fund a number of local authorities to start to deliver those. Um, and, and it's in early stages, but really starting to see some great results there. I think the important thing is, is around emergency tree tree plans or more fundamentally tree strategies um, and, and really uh, pushing local authorities to develop those and to make them all encompassing so that they look at protecting what's there as well as the opportunities to expand and, and create more. Thank you, so. Claire, yeah, I mean, I would, I would, um, I would, uh, well, um, agree with what uh, Sol has just said. I mean, obviously, urban trees have a vital role to play in helping kind of mitigate the impacts of air pollution, noise, and also reducing urban heat, heat island effects. We know they're really important for shading. So, and people love them as well. You know, <laughs> they're, they're absolutely um, a beloved part of our, our, our urban landscapes. Um, Natural England's got uh, an interesting project going on, um, funded from a um, shared outcome fund from the Treasury, which is working with the Tree Council and a number of the others um, to basically do some exploration with local authorities mm -hmm. about how to put more urban trees um, into different uh, situations. And I noticed on the chat there was quite a lot of um, initial chat about the Mayawaki approach, um, basically intensive planting. And that uh, project, which is being led by one of my colleagues, Sunita Welch, um, that, that looks at that, that explores and, and tests that method. And I think the initial um, findings have been um, really quite positive. So uh, there's some work going on there to look at that. That's great, thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that comes through on the chat and, and certainly from everything uh, that, we, that we've all been saying is this, the importance of the site assessment and the, the site survey to really understand uh, what's there, not just in terms of biodiversity, but, uh, you know, all of those different ecological functions and then the, the, the benefits of, of um, encouraging regeneration or, or tree planting. Um, and, and really just the importance of the data, you know, Claire, what you were saying, and, uh, and obviously it's all from the maps that you're using, and Emily, all the work that you do, you know, it's all, the, the data is just absolutely at, at the heart of that. And I think, you know, we rely so much on volunteers to, to send in their records of fungi or wildflowers or trees or, you know, the different biodiversity that, that we all see when we're out in woodlands or grasslands or whatever it might be. Um, so there's lots of, um, ways that people can send in their records or take part in monitoring schemes which um, are really crucial for, for that so just a real um, waving a, a flag for, for, for that data um, and the people who put it together. I'm thinking that uh, we could potentially run another session I know there's quite a lot of interest in the site survey and, and how you actually decide you know if you've got the right site uh, for woodland creation or tree planting um, and we could potentially run another session next year to look at that in more detail and what that, you know, what that really entails and how you, how you get it right. Um, and, you know, particularly for wild, wild plants and fungi from a plant life point of view. So we can definitely uh, keep that in mind. Um, and I think just a lot of uh, comments coming through about, you know, I think we do need to recognise the, the progress that's been made. We look back at the, you know, the plantations from uh, post Second World War, I think there's been comments there about actually, you know, a lot of those are being managed much better now for for wildlife. Um, 
and we're, we're not in the same situation as we were you know 60 70 years ago but you know we are all looking to see you know globally and, and nationally and locally you know to to create uh woodlands and trees that are good for the climate and for nature and for people so um i think it's you know it's good to recognize that progress that's been made but certainly lots of challenges ahead lots of um complexities uh, to deal with um but there's some really great resources there i think um you know we've had lots of good uh, links in the chat and we can um share the resources that um that our panelists are all have all highlighted um so I think we need to leave it there for today. We've run out of time, unfortunately. Um, like I said, the session will be available on YouTube. Um, the chat can be emailed to people if you can't copy it. I know there's been a bit of discussion about that. So if you just get in touch with Plant Life, we can email it to you. Um, and I'd just like to say a huge thank you to our panelists, to Emily and Claire and Saul. You've been brilliant and given us a really good insight into uh, some of the detail of this right tree, right place approach. And thank you to my colleagues behind the scenes, Felicity and Honor, for supporting the session. Um, and I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much.